Down Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And out of respect and adoration for the Lord and His Word, would you stand with me as I read verse 22 down through verse 33 and then pray and ask the Lord's blessing upon us. Hear now the word of the living God. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such things, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Let's pray. Father, do bless this word to our hearts and to our minds, O oh Lord, that you might be blessed, Lord, by our receiving this word and carrying it out, Lord, in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, we want to recap last week, just a few points to help us begin our sermon this morning. Remember, we discussed submission, sort of uh, demystifying it, I guess, to some degree, that submission doesn't require uh, anyone to be a doormat, that we learned two basic things last week in that we were created for submission. We were created for submission. Man was created to submit to God. The woman was created to submit to her husband, her head. It's all by creation. It's all by God's design. It's all according to God's divine wisdom. That's wisdom. Whenever we rail against what God has made, what God has created, and for the, its design and the purpose it has, we are railing against the wisdom of Almighty God. The illustration I have for us this morning that may be fitting, I hope you think it is, or will be, and that is, taking a hammer and trying to drive a screw in a board. Now, the hammer will drive the screw in the board. It will force the screw into the board. And it will look on the outside like it's going to hold. But it will not hold. It will not hold because the screw was not designed to be forced into the wood. It was designed to be screwed into the wood and to in every turn of the screwdriver to drive that screw down in that wood so that it would compress and hold against the threads of that screw. Well, you can force the screw into the wood by taking a hammer and, and hitting it and those threads do nothing but tear the wood and it will hold only for a short period of time. And that's much like man's wisdom as compared to God's. Man's wisdom looks good. That's what Paul was trying to help the Colossae church understand. Yeah, there's a form of wisdom in all of this philosophy out there, but it's, it's not any good. 
Now, I know that doesn't sound very scholarly. That's not a very scholarly phrase. It's not any good, but it's not any good. And I want you to understand that. I want you to see that. You see, we have to realize that this is the wisdom of the Lord. This is the way God designed it. This is the way he created man and woman, male and female. And when we rail against God's design, we can only bring harm to ourselves. Particularly if when there's been so much effort to force that screw down in that wood just only for a short period of time that it holds to only give way later on and cause greater damage. And the world has a lot of screws. It's framing in the wood. And it looks on the outside like wisdom, but it is not. So we learn that we were created for wisdom. The second thing we learn that we were created with the ability to have an eye toward excellence. That in our creation, God gave us an eye toward excellence and that we could spot, where we could recognize superior qualities. That's why Adam can completely wake up from the dust of the earth and fall down before God immediately. He had an eye for greatness. He had an eye for excellence. He had an eye for majesty. He was created to recognize God's superiority. Now, sin has marred that quality in us. We still have it. We still recognize superior athletes, musicians, preachers, scholars, uh, wives, husbands, you know, drivers, whatever the case may be, we still have an eye toward recognizing those who excel in various areas of life. But the problem with it now is we are jealous, we become embittered, or we become indifferent, or we become lazy, or we, whatever the case may be, we don't respond in a way a righteous and a holy person would respond to those qualities in in recognizing that superiority. But beloved, it's there. And it's there, and it's, it's there because God created this world to be recognized in, in these areas of superiority, uh, the inferiors, superiors, and equals. He, he made the world, and we all have those relationships. We are all superiors in something. We are all inferiors in things, and we are all equals in things. We all bear responsibility to those three categories of life, and we must learn how to recognize the superiority of others. Now, this aids us, and it helps us this morning in addressing the marriage covenant. These relationships that begin at verse 22 and end at chapter 6, verse 9, really Paul is addressing in these three categories the Christian home. And he begins with the most important relationship in the home, and that is the husband and wife. The husband and wife is the most important relationship in the home. It's not the parent and child. Mothers, it's not your children, though they require much attention. Dads, it's not the children. It's not your sons. It's your wife. Wives, it's your husband. That is the most important relationship in this, in the home. And it must be so because that's the way God designed it and intended it. And we're going to look at this. As Paul addresses the home and as he addresses these three categories, beloved, he makes sure we understand that this is what a believing household looks like. There is, a, there is certainly a, a contrast being made here. This is a Christian home. The unbelieving home does not look this way. The unbelieving home does not... Uh, uh, does not perform submission for these reasons. It does not focus on these relationships for these same reasons. This is what a Christian home looks like as over against the unbelieving one. Now we need to understand this. 
beloved, and we should look at three things this morning from this text of Scripture. There should be three areas that we are going to address as we deal with the text itself. The first one is going to be the cultural need for addressing the Christian home in a pagan or unbelieving society. The cultural need for addressing the Christian home in a pagan or unbelieving society. Secondly, that we should understand by, uh, the, the home by making the covenantal and theological connections. Paul makes some covenantal and theological connections that we can't miss. And if we miss them, we mess up. When we miss these connections, we, we, we miss the, the whole picture. So we've got to make the covenantal and theological connections in the text. And then thirdly, the benefits received by having a Christian home or Christian marriage over against an unbelieving one. Now let's begin to address these three areas by, first of all, recognizing the cultural problem. The cultural problem. When Paul wrote or dictated these words, these were just these words were just as offensive to women in his day as it was or as it is in ours. It was just as absurd to the men in his day as it is in our day. You must recognize and understand that feminism in and of itself is not a 21st century phenomenon or philosophy. It resulted and has existed since the fall of mankind. Man's indifference to his wife and indifference to his calling by God is not anything new. Men have been lazy for a long time. And, men, and women have desired to rule over the man for a long, long time. These are not new things. In Paul's day and time in the uh, Asia Minor and Ephesus where he was in the Greece, uh, the, Greece uh, the Grecians had a, a, a range of philosophies that ranged from complete licentiousness in community and culture with, of course, in Ephesus being the Diana cult, the fertility cults. The fertility cults were dominated by females. So Paul was writing these words in the midst of a very pagan and dark society. These, these readers of the epistle had come out of that environment. So there's a cultural problem that Paul is addressing. And when we, when we beloved, like in Paul's day, when we come out of these environments that we come out of, what do we bring with us? What do we bring with us when we come into the church? We bring these ideas with us. We bring the ideas that we were raised with, how a man treats a woman, how a woman treats a man, how a husband and wife uh, relate to one another. And believe it or not, and you, you may not want to recognize this, but you are tremendously affected by your upbringing. By the way your dad and mom interacted together, your version and view of marriage is going to be greatly impacted by that environment that you grew up in for 20 plus years possibly. Now think about the cultural problem as Paul penned these words. He was very much aware of the feminism of the day. He was very much aware of the fertility cults. He was very much aware of the attitudes and the practices of these Christians that are now professing Jesus Christ who have been saved from that life. And Paul brings this gospel home in their marriage, if you will, these relationships. Paul begins to take the gospel and he begins to apply it in the most important place we have, and that's the home. Why is the home such a sensitive topic? Why is the home 
such a, an important place when we start dealing with true convictions. Well, let's think about the home for a minute. Most of us see the home as a respite from the world, right? You know, we see it as that refuge. We, we are bombarded by that hustle and bustle of the world and the, just the activities of making a living and dealing with the absurdity of the world, or whether it be college, or whether it be workplace, whether it be just common activities. And the home is the place where we relax. The home is the place where we sort of let our hair down. It's the place where we're unguarded, if you will. We're all guarded here. Well, some of us might be. Some of us should be. You know, you, you, you used to live in a day and time where you know, you didn't act a certain way out in public. There was a little bit of, of acknowledgement that you, you, you know, put your best foot forward, you put your best face on, not in, in a hypocritical manner, but that because, you know, the respect for others. But at home, you can loosen up. You, you, are able to relax, if you will. You're able to rest there. And it's the place that we have our closest and dearest relationships, or should have. So it's the place where our Christianity does shine the most, or less. In the home is where our Christianity really finds its own it's easy to say out in public, you know, God bless you. But it's easy, it's, it's harder in the home to take the time to bless the person with prayer. You see, I mean, the home is where, beloved, we live. And Paul begins to bring the gospel home to our marriages if there is no effect of Christ in your life, there will be no effect in your home, in your marriage. See, that, that's, where it, that's where it begins. You know, I, I hear it, and it is, I think, true that, um, you know, Jesus said a, a prophet is without honor in his own home. It's certainly hard when you have an unbelieving spouse and a believing spouse. That's difficult. But we're not talking about that in this situation. We're talking about where both spouses are Christians. We're talking about where there is the, the, a, a Christian home in society. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, how does our Christianity affect the home place? Well, first of all, it has to affect the husbands and wives. It has to affect the husbands and wives. And as we look at our text of Scripture, we're going to begin where Paul begins. We're going to begin with the woman. Paul begins by saying in verse 22 that the, the wives ought to be subject or be subject to their own husbands as to the Lord. And that's interesting. From this text of Scripture, there are several things that come to mind. That First of all, wives must be submissive. It's not a negotiation. It's not in the marriage. It's not in your contract agreement. Like so many, what's becoming so popular today in marriage is, you know, each one write out what, what belongs to them. And so they truly hinder the true one flesh relationship because they're scared the other one's well, only out for their money or whatever the case may be. And a wife may be afraid, you know what, if I marry him, he may make me wash the dishes or something, so I'm going to put in my contract that there's a dishwasher involved or whatever the case may be. I mean, you get silly things like that. Paul makes the connection. He says that the wives must be submissive to their husbands. The Christian woman has a need here. Her need is to understand who she is in Christ. The need here is assuming 
that she understands that she's been taken out of the world. She's been brought into the church. She has a relationship with Jesus Christ and he has not forgotten the creation mandate. She was created for submission to the Lord and for submission to her husband. And so Paul affirms that. He doesn't shy away from it. And if he was going to shy away from it, he would certainly do it in this Grecian culture. Because this culture, I would say, was more feministic than even in our own culture, though we're getting there. And maybe in some places in America, there's certainly a lot more hatred for the creation order, for the things that God has set up between male and female than in other places. So typically the South is a little bit behind as far as philosophies go. But it's here. It's here. And we hear it in many places. Paul is teaching us that the wife has the need to put on Christ, that when she puts Christ on, she puts on submission. That's the point he makes. Her, her submission, her putting on of Christ will, will demonstrate itself in submission to her husband. Her need is also not only that she put on Christ and demonstrate submission to her husband, but she needs to understand the bigger picture. Now, I'm not giving you a Christian marriage manual class here. I'm hitting the highlights. I'm wanting to impress you with the deep, the, the content, the thought here, the issues of the culture in that day and as it relates to our own day so that we recognize and understand, you know what? Nothing new. Nothing new here. The wife has a need to understand the bigger picture. It's not just her small environment with the submission to her husband that's important. And it is important. But what's more important is the picture she conveys to the world. Notice what the text says. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their own husbands in everything. Wives, you must have a bigger picture of the reality. Don't let your focus be so much on the submission duty itself. You miss the bigger, more glorious picture. The more glorious picture is that the Lord has ordained the marriage covenant to reflect the redemption covenant. The covenant of redemption, the covenant of grace, whereby the church gets to exercise submission to her head and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a beautiful picture. What a beautiful picture. If you don't make the covenantal and theological connection in your submission, you're going to miss the, the beauty of it and the glory of it. You have to make those connections. Just as you volunteered in the marriage covenant and made promises to be a help meet to your husband, Christ has promised to be Savior of the body. And what kind of promises did we make when we joined the church? To submit to Him. You know why? You know the promise is like this. He's called Lord. You know what Lord means? Master. Master. Boss, ruler, sovereign. He has the, he, he's the right and the prerogative and the authority to tell us what to do. So the wives have a need to step back and see the bigger picture and recognize that her submission is not just simply a submission to her husband. It is, as verse 22 says, as to the Lord himself for the fact that as the world views our Christian marriages, it has an evangelistic flavor to it. That when the world sees our marriages, our Christian marriages, there is an evangelistic flavor flavor to our marriages and our homes by the way the husband and wife interact with one another. Same way for the husbands. The husband is to put on Christ and as he has put on Christ as Savior, 
what is one of the natural outflowings of him putting on Christ is that he love his wife. This love is not simply an emotional love, though it will have emotion to it. It's better than that. Remember this, young people, particularly young people, maybe some of our older people here. Remember this. Love, if love is just emotional, it's transient. It's, it's short-lived. Emotional love only is not what you're looking for. You're not looking for that emotional love. You're looking for that covenantal love. You're looking for that love that binds itself to promises, to commitments, to conviction. There is a commitment in this. I want you to be my wife. I take you to be my lawfully wedded wife. To love, to cherish, to uphold, to honor, to protect, to lead. I choose you. And I promise by the strength God puts in this body, by the, by the grace that he gives me in the church to perform that duty to the best of my ability. You see, because we live in a culture that's full of emotional love, we have a tremendously high divorce rate. When the zeal goes out, the marriage goes out. When the passion loses its flame and burn, that, well, we got to move on to somebody else. That's not the kind of love you look for. Imagine us as the bride of Jesus. Imagine how many times we would have run our husband off if he'd have been any normal man. Imagine how the church would have run the husband off if he'd be a normal man. But see, the Lord made promises. The Lord has committed to be head. He has made a promise in the covenant of redemption that he would secure and save a people for God's namesake, that he would lay down his life, that he would even in the, the face of difficulty and hardship, remember the Lord's life was not one of leisure, of leisure and, pl and pleasure. He said, I don't have a place to lay my head. Even foxes have it better than I do. I didn't come to establish estates. I didn't come to amass wealth. I didn't come. I came to do the will of my father. I came to lay down my life for the bride. And he agonized over it. He wept over it. And he fulfilled it. Is that the kind of husband you want? Is that the kind of husband you want to be? See, that's what Paul is hitting us with. That's what Paul is, is putting in our faces. He's saying, as the man, as we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, the husband is to put on Christ, that it will begin to show itself in the, the, the how he loves his wife. And he will not be embittered toward her. Now, you got to understand something about the cultural philosophies here. I mentioned earlier that it ranged everything from a very licentious society and culture, sort of a, a free sexual culture, to a stoic culture where virginity was highly prized and adored. Now, both would have problems in a marriage. Because even, even when you bring this one group, the licentious group together, you have practices, you have ideas that are not compatible with the marriage covenant. When you bring this other extreme into the marriage, well, the prizing of virginity above everything else, that can be a problem in the marriage covenant. So the Lord is, I mean, Paul is addressing this and he's saying, listen, you have a, lo a new Lord, a new master here. You have a new relationship. This relationship is both covenantal, it's theological. Don't miss the connection. It's interesting to, for us to note, beloved, that 
Paul inserts in the midst of this uh, teaching on husbands and wives the idea of the church. Look at verse with me. Uh, look down at verse 24 and following. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be subject to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Look at verse 32. This mystery is great. Now you think this mystery, what's he talking about? Verse 31. The reason a man shall leave his father and mother shall be joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. That's not a mystery. And here's why. God made man and woman to be attracted to each other. That's not a mystery. There's no mystery why a man would leave his mom and dad to go be married to a woman. There's no reason for a mom and dad to wonder what strange things are happening when their daughter is attracted to another man. That's natural. That's normal. That's the way God made us. So Paul isn't referring to that mystery. The mystery Paul's referring to in verse 32, as he says, but I'm speaking of reference to Christ in the church. See, the mystery is how can such a holy, holy Savior desire and love such an unholy people? See, that's the mystery. The mystery is how can these two be compatible? And they have to be made compatible through his blood and through his covenant. Through, the, through him keeping his promises to the Father and bringing and doing what? Cleansing us. Cleansing us. There's nothing, there's nothing attractive. There's nothing in this holy God attractive in us. Nothing. Yet he sets his love on us. See, that's the mystery Paul is talking about here. What Paul means by this mystery, he says, I can't, I don't comprehend it. I don't know why God would love the church the way he does. I don't know. There's no, there's no human compre, uh, there's no human way to reason and understand why a holy God would love such an unholy people. Now let's think about this. So, brothers, we have this cultural problem, but we need to understand also the contemporary answer. Paul was dealing with a cultural problem. Problem. He had all these different philosophies that all of these philosophies were a hindrance to the marriage covenant. All of these philosophies were a hindrance to the Christian home. So what's the answer? Well, the answer is a contemporary one. Now you say, why a contemporary answer? Why? Well, because Paul takes Scripture and he applies it to his culture. It's a contemporary answer to the immediate cultural problem, and it's the same thing we have for us in our situation. What's the answer for our day and time? How do we address the, Christi, the Christian home? How do we address Christian marriages? What are we to address them with? It's the same way that Paul addressed it in his day. He's to remind us of our duties, and he's to remind us of our covenant and our, uh, the theological connections, he's to remind us, beloved, he goes all the way back to Genesis. He goes all the way back to Genesis, Paul does, and brings that teaching all the way into the Grecian culture and society, and he says, here's the answer for you. It's the same way in the 21st century. The Christian family in the first century, as well as the Christian family in the 21st century must turn to Paul's advice and put into practice his counsel if we are going to reform our homes and all of our relationships in Christ. And Paul does tell us, as I've already read to you, Paul gives the, the Christian home, or, or at least the marriage, a divine Resemblance. It has a, a divine, um, it has a, a duty to the divine in that the, the man and woman help the world understand Christ in his church. Let me ask you this. 
The husband and wife are micro descriptions of Christ in his church. This gives marriage a greater influence and role beyond the, bond, the bounds of just the home itself. Now, let me ask you the question. Look at the typical professing Christian home today. And do you see the typical evangelical church? Yes, I'm afraid you do. I'm afraid that when we look around us to the typical professing Christian home today, we see the typical evangelical church. A mediocre obedience. Usually obedience, the greater the difficulty when there's a tragic, when there's a tragedy, when there's a, a hardship in the home, we become more Christian. But as far as a Consistent Christianity displayed in submission and reverence and respect and love and all of the things that come along with the Christian household, particularly in the marriage covenant, we see something very, very dangerous, very sad. We see a, a, a bride who's asleep. We see a bride who's asleep. They don't take their duty seriously. The problem is basic and universal. Where there is no submission in the home, there is no respect. Where there is no love, there is no giving of oneself to the other. Paul addresses these two important factors in the Christian marriage, love and respect. And to whatever degree one has respect, they will accordingly have the same degree of honor and submission and likewise with love. See, to whatever degree, beloved, we understand our role to our wives and husbands. To whatever degree we love and respect the Lord, that love and respect will reflect in our most intimate relationships on earth. That's why you can say as a parent, when you rail against me, son and daughter, when you rail against these godly commandments, this godly counsel, you're not railing just against me. Who else are you railing against? The Lord. You're teaching your children that this relationship, this earthbound relationship, has a greater significance than earth. It also carries a heavenly relationship. It also carries with it an, an, an eternity attached to it. When you rail against this wisdom, this godly advice, you are railing against not only your mom and dad, but the Lord. And likewise, when married couples rail against God's counsel, Paul's advice, John's advice, Peter's advice, and we take Phil's advice, Dr. Phil, when we take all of these other uh, various worldly gurus out there, we are rejecting not just Paul, we're rejecting the Lord. We don't just reject Peter, we reject the Lord. So the problem is a basic problem, but the problem is also universal. Now let's look at the text itself and let's make some helpful applications. Notice Paul says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, this is important. First of all, we are reminded here that a woman who is surrounded by the world, she's filled with a desire to lead her husband. She's filled with that desire. Women, you must understand this, that as, as you address submission in your own heart, as you reject, uh, uh, as you um, address the respect factor in your own heart. You must first recognize, number one, I was a woman created for submission. I was a woman created for respect. I was a woman created perfectly to display what God has commanded me to do in this text of Scripture. I was perfectly made for it. I was made for it, and that is my joy and happiness to be that. Though sin has entered into my heart, Sin has corrupted my thinking, and now I desire to be the head of my husband. I desire to lead him and not follow. I don't desire to respect him. He must 
meet certain needs before I will begin to even respect him. As a woman, you're filled with the world. You must understand this. I have all of these worldly philosophies bombarding me all the time. I'm filled not only with the world in itself, but I'm fighting these own temptations. And yet, I must understand the biblical position Paul is teaching me here, and I must submit to it. That's the first thing we must do. You see, Paul's already addressed over in chapter 2, Paul's already addressed what a Christian looks like. Paul's already said this. He said, we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. You got to recognize that. Paul's already addressed that the Christian wife comes with a different perspective. She recognizes the tug of the world. She recognizes her own sinfulness, but she also says, I must submit to my Lord. That's why verse 22 says, as to the Lord. You almost can see the wisdom of, of the Lord here working through the Apostle Paul because it's often, it's often heard in counseling, well, you know what? I've just decided he's not worthy of my respect. And so Paul said, well, let me put this in here because that's not what it says. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. That is, the goal, the goal and the object of the submission reaches further than the husband. That because you submit to the Lord, you gladly submit to your husband. How does a Christian man surrounded by the world, filled with his own sinful desires to be anything but committed to God and held, to, held responsible to others? Well, he does the same thing, doesn't he? We must recognize as husbands, we must recognize, listen, we have the world outside of us bombarding us. We have a desire to walk away from the whole situation. We have a desire not to deal with it. How many times we say whatever and be done with it. And yet we know, just like Adam in the garden, Adam is standing there while his wife sins. And you got to see the picture here. Adam stands there. He's head. He's the covenant head. He stands there and watches his wife sins, and then she hands him the fruit and says, that's good. Take a bite. You won't die. Okay. And he bites. He eats. He sins against God. You see, beloved, men, we must understand our tendency is not to be head but it's to acquiesce our headship and to let the wife lead. And we have to, but listen, but we were created to lead. We were created to, to nurture, to love, to protect, to provide for. We were created for that. You say, well, I don't do it well. You have to learn to do it well in Christ. You have to learn, listen, you have to learn to do it well, guys, because you got to teach your sons to do it well. Ladies, you have to learn to be to do your wifing well because you got to teach your daughters what does it look like to submit. See, it's impossible without the Lord Jesus Christ to do this, isn't it? It's impossible without Him. It's impossible if you're not born again. These old paths are too strong. The wisdom is too great for us in the old paths. We must learn to put on Jesus Christ and take him seriously in our marriages. So how does a Christian woman begin to put Paul's advice into practice? I want to remind you of that screw again. Anything that you, anything that you cling to as advice apart from Scripture, is like driving that screw with a hammer. It's going to look like it's it done the job. I mean, it's going to put the screw in the wood. And, and the world has all kinds of advice about the way you should, your, the marriage should look. 
All kinds of, the the spectrum is broad concern. You can find anything you want, any desire you have in your heart. I'm sure you can find a book that will agree with you on that matter. But the point being is we must learn first and foremost to agree with Scripture. We need to stop hammering screws in the wood and start taking the screwdriver and then driving the screws so we can have a solid, strong marriage. The first thing a woman needs to do to understand this submission and respect is, again, what I've been saying, and I'll say it again for the sake of emphasis so you remember it, is that you were made for it. You were made for it. You were made to submit to your husband. You were made to respect him. There's nothing odd there. It's natural from a creation perspective. It's normal from a creation perspective, but it's abnormal in a sinful world. Because in a sinful world, everybody's number one. And if everybody's number one in a sinful world, how are you going to have submission? You can only have agreements. So, beloved, first of all, you recognize Like man, she was created to be submissive to her Lord and she was created to be submissive to man as her head. Verse 23 of our text teaches us this. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. Secondly, She must see herself in union with her husband and not against him. If he is the head, that is a vital union. What does the body need? A head. Does the body function without the head? No. In fact, a body without a head is nothing. It's deadness. It's in one sense, beloved, when you make the theological connection, when a wife becomes a one flesh relationship with her husband, then they can, as they begin to express the dominion mandate in their lives, bringing in Christ's honor and glory, they begin living. They begin a a, a vitality of covenant relationship where where both parties are seeking the best of the other and they begin at one to grow in grace way beyond they ever would in a single state. And that doesn't minimize the single state. I think there's a tendency when we teach on marriage to act as if the single state is absurd. It's not. I don't want to, I think marriage is normal. It's the normal estate. But there are those who have been given the gift of singleness. And it's not to be despised. It's not to be minimized. It's not to be frowned upon. It's not to be looked at as absurd or odd. No. Christ gives some men and some women the gift of singleness for greater service to himself. Complete dedication. And I think missionaries um, in the past have had this gift as well. So, beloved, we must see and recognize that her union with her husband is, it, she, has, she must see herself in union with her husband and not against him. The man by God's design is the woman's head. Let's look at a passage of scripture. I'm going to put, I know we haven't gone to many for a reason. Look at 1 Corinthians 11. This text of scripture is going to help us understand the creation order. Look at verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 11. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and that man is the head of a woman and God is the head of Christ. Now you see in that verse, Paul is not teaching that just the husband is the head of the wife in the sense in a covenantal relationship in a special relationship, but even in creation, man is the head of the woman. Man in the creation order serves as her protector, a benefactor, 
her leader. And that's a verse that would address politics. That's a verse that would address many of these other areas in our culture and society. God designed man to be the leader. Now, the problem with sinful man is he doesn't want to be the leader. We all run from it because leadership takes a lot, a lot of responsibility, a lot of work. You may have to put off spring break. You may have to put off a lot of things. You may have to put some things down. I want to give you an example of what it means to take this seriously, men. I use Calvin and Farrell as examples. These are two historical figures. I know you remember Calvin, but you may not remember uh, Will Farrell uh, Farrell in this. Uh, he was uh, equal with Calvin, and he had come to Geneva, and Farrell had told Calvin that he, would, that he wanted him to stay and use his gifts in order to support and advance the reformation of the church there in Geneva. Calvin didn't want to do it. Calvin, in his mind, wanted to go off into the Alps, and he wanted to live, retire in the life of a scholar and write books. He didn't want to do it. And there's a great picture of Pharaoh pointing his finger at Calvin, sort of to give us the sense of the context there. And Pharaoh says, oh, I hope as you go off into these mountains to retire, to write your books, and live the life of an easy scholar, God curses you. But you won't find it easy. Well, it just shook Calvin to the core. And Calvin did not live the life of an easy scholar. He stayed in Geneva where there was constant hardship. He was constantly mocked. He was constantly abused. People would name their dogs after Calvin. That's how much respect he had among the people. I mean, he, he was the laughing stock of so many people, and yet look what God did with him to advance the church. You see, beloved, we were made for God's glory. We were made for leadership, men. And God may be calling us to certain aspects of leadership that we may be fighting because we have to put off our life. We have to put off the things we want to do and do the things God's calling us to do. That's what it means to be a head. That's what it means to be a leader. That's what it means to love as Christ loved the church. Because what, what does Paul teach us here? in Ephesians 5 about Christ loving the church. He gave what? Himself. See, that's what love is. Love is the giving of oneself. Everything. All that I have is brought to bear in this relationship. To love you, to nurture you, to protect you. And, and I'll tell you this. I mean, there is something very biblical and right about a man stepping in front of a woman and being her protector. But nowadays you have women stepping in front of men. That's a shame. That's a shame in our society. Let me give you another thing that is a reversal, and I don't like it, and I'll express it in my home. You know, these, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, spy movies, you know, uh, these uh, futuristic movies are these, um, these names escape me, but these, uh, you know, who's the heroine? Who's the heroine in these movies? A woman. She's the savior. She, she's the one that's coming to save the day. She saves the men. It's becoming more and more popular. It shows you the, the shift in philosophy. It shows you the, the, the world. See, that's exactly where Greece was. Diana was the savior. Diana was the, the one that stood with the spear in her hand. She was the one that protected the children. She was the one that brought fertility. She was the one that caused the crops to, to grow out of the ground. She brought the rain. She protected the armies in battle. Where are we today? Where are we today in our own society? We're right, getting right back to the cults of the women, the female cults. They're the heroines of the day. And you see, why? you know what? We like it. Men, they, men are like, oh, yeah, let them do it. I don't want to do it. I just want to sit back and watch. 
You see, we can't do that if we take Paul's advice. So you can't do that if you, if you put on Jesus Christ. Because to put on Jesus Christ as a man is to put on the robe and the mantle of protector, lover, follower, leader, guider, nurturer. Yeah, Paul, you know, Paul doesn't say it, but... You know, you can understand the relationship that Paul has with his church here. They know these things. She must understand she's in union with her husband. She's not opposed to him. Thirdly, she must see her ultimate goal is as unto the Lord. Her joy is not wrapped up in the sole act of obedience, of submission to her husband, but the one who blesses obedience. The one who blesses obedience. You know why a wife can truly submit joyfully to her husband? And you can do it if you're a Christian. Because Christ will bless you mightily. Christ will love upon you all of the benefits of this submission. And let me, and let me say this too. Before, before you sit here and say, you know what? I do love the Lord, but submitting to my husband is a whole different matter. Well, let me tell you this. Jesus submitted to inferior men. Now, you ladies may think you're far superior than your husbands. That's the sinful tendency. I'm smarter, better. I do it so much better. I don't even know why he's doing that. I mean, they'll tell you how to build a house. They'll tell you how to do anything. You know, that, that's what doesn't seem right to me. It's just sinful tendency to want to lead. Jesus submitted to inferior men. Gladly. Why did Jesus do it gladly? Because he had a bigger mission. His mission was to bring honor to the Father's name. His mission was to redeem a people for God's own glory. And what did Jesus do? He was like a lamb who was taken before his shearers who did not open his mouth and led to the slaughter. Jesus submitted to an inferior court. And he said, I, I am Lord, I am King, I have myriads of angels at my beck and call, but I'm not going to call them. I'll submit to this mock court and this injustice. I will lay down my life willfully. You, you see, beloved, so when we talk about unable to submit, look to Jesus. You see, we don't need a bunch of counseling books to learn how to submit, do we? We need to look to Jesus. Study Jesus' life and you'll see submission. What about the men? What about us men? What do we need to do? We're filled with the world. We don't want to do it. We would rather not do it. We must look to Christ. We must understand our place as head. We must understand what we were made to be. We were made to lead. We were created and divinely appointed to be a leader a leader and a head. You were made for that. And you want to know how to lead, look to Jesus. You want to know how to love people, look to Jesus. You don't need a bunch of books. And I'm not saying marriage manuals aren't helpful. I'm not saying that books cannot be helpful. They can be very helpful. I have a shelf full of them. But I will tell you this, Paul is pointing them to Jesus. And that's what he says in the text. Look at what he says. <clears throat> he says in verse 28, So husbands, after talking about Christ, loving and sanctifying the church, ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. And he who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Now this is important to note because say you didn't have a Christian home. You cannot fall back on that in your marriage problems. You can't say, well, I didn't have a Christian home. Look to Christ. Look to Christ as your example. How did he love and nurture the church? How did he give himself up for the church? Notice men like the ladies, the bigger picture. 
What does the world see when they see your leadership? Do they see a, a Savior that loves the church? Well, we must understand as husbands and wives, as a Christian marriage, it has to have the gospel applied to it. If our marriages doesn't have the impact of the gospel on it, we're not Christians. We're not Christians. And that's hard. Because if we're robed in Christ, we'll have a desire to lead. If we're robed in Christ, we'll have a desire to submit. And that means the woman brings the superior quality she has and she couples it with the husband by covenant, by promises. And she says, I will use my superior qualities to help as you lead. And the man says, I will take my superior qualities and I will couple them with yours. And I will lead with your help. And we will bring the kingdom of heaven into the home on earth, that we will couple our qualities together and by God's grace grow in our weaker qualities and we will bring heaven to earth and we will by God's grace achieve what we were created to do in Christ. What we forfeited in Adam, we will achieve in Christ. Now, beloved, make no mistake about it. Verse 33 is what we'll end with. Nevertheless, each individual among you is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Brothers and sisters, love and respect. These are two very important words to the marriage covenant, love and respect. Both are verbs. Both require action. Both require duty. Both require what we would say in Ephesians 2.10, good works. It's not just the phenomenon of your mind, oh, I respect him here, but I don't show it here. I don't talk in a way that's respectful to my husband. He says, oh, I love her. Oh, I, she knows I love her here. But there's nothing in his life and nothing in his actions that displays the kind of love Jesus has given to the church. It's a high standard. It's a high standard that I'm sure that many of us can grow in and grow up in. But we must, because that's the advice of the Apostle Paul. And Paul's been given the authority to command the church in the ways of the Lord. So brothers and sisters, may he bless us as we take this marriage covenant seriously, as we see this permanent relationship as a glorious one, as one that displays to the world, the fallen world around us, the relationship that Christ has with his church and the church has with Christ. May we repent of anything that we can repent of and may we set today a path before us to do well in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words and the address this morning. Lord, and we do understand the cultural issues of our day. We're not blind to the philosophies that rage around us. And we know that they are always uh, calling and, Lord, even appealing to us in our sin nature, appealing to our fallenness. So, Lord, by your grace, let us put that off. By your grace, let us grow up in the teaching of the Apostle Paul and the Word of God. And may we set before us today this straight path, this path that will lead to respect and love, this path that will lead our homes in displaying to the world the love Christ has for a sinful church and the, the submission the church owes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help our homes grow in grace and be what it's been created to be. And help our young people and help, Lord, help all of these single ones, these young people realize that they have a duty. Number one, to pray for the marriages in this church for the children to pray for their, their moms and their dads and their marriages. Lord, that they too would see that the world has nothing to offer 
in relationship to what you have so divinely ordained and created for your glory. The world has no answer. The relationships that are built upon the world are built upon sand, and they will give way to judgment. They will not last. So, Lord, establish us upon the rock of your word that we might, Lord, continue on looking at these relationships, Lord, in light of your truth, Lord, in light of what we've been made to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.